Since 1992, DW Fern mic preamps, equalizers, and compressors have been used in some of the world's best studios and in private use and home studios around the world. This tutorial will help you get the most from your DW Fern products, learn what each control does, and see the best setup starting points for a variety of recording situations. Learn how to interface our products with the rest of your studio gear. Take a peek inside and see how our products are made and learn from Doug Fern's experience in over 40 years in pro audio. The VT-12 is a special purpose microphone preamplifier made specifically for use with ribbon microphones. You can put other types of microphones into the VT-12 and it'll work, but it's not optimum and we're gonna see why throughout this tutorial. If you haven't already watched the VT-2 tutorial, it might be a good idea to take a look at that because most of the features on the VT-12 are the same as they are on the VT-2, and I go into some detail about how to set up the VT-2 and what the controls do and so on in that video. And uh, rather than duplicate that here, you can just go take a look at that. We're only going to discuss the things that are unique uh, to the VT-12. Like the VT-2 and like all our products, the VT-12 is a vacuum tube based device. It's very similar to the VT-2, not only in its controls and appearance, but also in its circuitry. In fact, it's exactly the same um, in many respects. It uses the same input and output transformers, same power supply, and the circuit topology is essentially the same, except we use different tubes in the VT-12 to provide more gain. And that's one of the key things for a ribbon mic preamp is additional gain. But before we get into those details, let's talk a little bit about different types of microphones and what makes them different and why you need a special preamp oftentimes for a ribbon microphone. We'll start with a dynamic microphone because that's one of the easier ones to understand and we can build upon that explaining the others. Dynamic microphones generally are thought of more as a live performance microphone and they're very good at that because they're very rugged and pretty much bulletproof, whereas a lot of studio microphones uh, couldn't survive a period of time on stage. So dynamics are good for that. The way they work is quite simple. If you took one apart, you'd find there's a diaphragm, which is uh, facing towards the sound source. This looks sort of like a little miniature um, loudspeaker. And in fact, loudspeakers and Dynamic microphones are essentially the same. It's just one is used to convert sound waves into electrical energy. The other one's used to convert electrical energy into sound waves. Of course, the size of a microphone diaphragm is much smaller than a speaker uh, cone, but they work on the same principle. In a microphone, sound hitting that diaphragm causes it to move very little, but enough to move an attached coil of wire uh, which is mounted inside a strong magnetic field, and that generates a small voltage in that wire, which is then routed out through a transformer to the output of the mic, and then to your mic preamp. Very simple system. It's been around for a hundred years and, and works very well. Now, if you were to take that concept of the dynamic microphone and apply it to a ribbon microphone, we can see how the ribbon uh, is similar in many ways. In fact, technically speaking, a ribbon microphone is a dynamic microphone, but it's an entirely different principle. But let's first of all, let's take our dynamic microphone and we're going to get rid of the diaphragm entirely. So all we have left is the coil of wire inside the magnet. And what we're going to do next is take that coil of wire and stretch it out so we only have one turn of the many turns on, on the original coil just one turn, place that in the magnetic field, and we're gonna take that piece of wire, we're gonna flatten it out and stretch it out until it's extremely thin, maybe only a quarter of an inch wide or less and maybe an inch or two long. And instead of being the generating element of dynamic mic, now what we have is a ribbon mic. And that ribbon is made of, generally of a very thin aluminum foil. If you think of your household aluminum foil in the kitchen, well, this stuff is, you know, significantly orders of magnitude thinner than that. And when that um, ribbon 
uh, is exposed to sound, it vibrates ever so slightly inside that magnetic field and generates a voltage, just like in the dynamic microphone. Now the difference, of course, is that we have only one turn, no diaphragm, none of those things that give a dynamic microphone more output level. So the output level of a ribbon microphone is going to be significantly less than a dynamic microphone. Now let's look at the third type of microphone that you're likely to find in a studio, and that's the condenser mic, which is probably the one most often used in recording. It's an excellent microphone for many purposes, extremely uh, high quality, good frequency response, excellent transient response, and uh, provides very high quality sound. Now this works on a slightly different principle. It still uses a diaphragm like the dynamic microphone, but it's just a thin, very thin layer of some sort of plastic covered with a metallic coating, again very thin, often gold or something like that, with one little tiny flexible wire attached to the center of it. And in back of that uh, diaphragm is a rigid plate about the same size as the diaphragm. And between the two of those are closely spaced it forms a capacitor, an electronic capacitor. And when sound waves hit that diaphragm, it vibrates and just minutely changes the capacitance between those two plates, one from the back plate and one from the diaphragm. And that small change of capacitance goes through active circuitry, either solid state or vacuum tube, and it converted from a varying capacitance into a varying voltage. And because it has this additional amplification stage, which is really more of a impedance transformation than amplification, but the output level, the condenser mic, is very high, much higher than the dynamic and much, much higher than the ribbon microphone. In fact, if we were to compare the three types of microphones, we could say that the condenser microphone, which has the highest output, has an output level of about minus 40 dB. Now we're going to go into details of dB here, but just for the sake of uh, comparison, we'll just use the term dB. So minus 40 for the condenser, dynamic microphone is less, about minus 50, and a ribbon microphone is even less at about minus 60. Now, of course, those levels aren't absolute. They depend on the sound source, how close the mic is, and so on. But for a given uh, mic placement, the three mics will give you roughly those same three different output levels. So you can see with a condenser mic with an output level of minus 40, it doesn't take a whole lot of um, amplification to get that up to the plus four that we need for professional recording. In fact, that only takes uh, 44 dB of gain. When I designed the VT1 and VT2 mic preamps, I had condenser mics in mind so I decided to have 54 dB of gain, which gave you the necessary 44 dB of gain, plus an extra 10 just so that you had, if you had low level sources or a dynamic mic or even a ribbon mic, you'd have a little extra gain there to accommodate those. For the ribbon microphone, we're talking about a minus 60. We're talking about 20 dB less level. So the VT12 was designed with 70 dB of, of, uh, of gain not quite 20 dB more than the VT2, but close to it. And that accommodates ribbon microphones much better. It gives you plenty of level that you wouldn't normally have. As we talked about in the VT2 tutorial, microphones have a standard for the impedance that they're supposed to present to the world. And microphone preamplifiers have a standard that they're supposed to present to the microphone plugged into them. The standard specifies that the microphone should be 150 ohms and the input impedance of the mic preamp should be 1500 ohms. These are standards that have been in place for a long, long time and adhering to those standards by both the mic manufacturers and the preamp manufacturers will ensure that the sound of the microphone is what the microphone designer intended and what the preamp designer intended. When you deviate from those generally, the sound is not quite as good and it doesn't exactly represent what the original design concepts for the mic and the mic preamp were. Now ribbon microphones are a little different. They like to have a much higher loading impedance than the 1500 ohms that's normally provided by, mic, by your standard mic preamp. 
I spoke to a number of manufacturers of the world's top ribbon microphones and asked them all the same question, and that is, what kind of uh, impedance does your microphone like to be loaded by? I was looking for some help in designing the input stage of the VT12 so that it accommodated the uh, ribbon microphones best. And the answers I got ranged from 2,500 ohms to as high as you can make it. And if there was any consensus among all the manufacturers, they all tended to agree that 10,000 ohm load impedance was a good point to aim for. And that's the way I designed the VT12. The input impedance on the VT12 is 10,000 ohms. That provides the optimum loading on most ribbon microphones. That's the way they sound the best. They have the best transient response. Their frequency response is the best, and so on. Now, what happens if you plug a condenser mic or a dynamic mic, which is looking for 1,500 ohms, into the VT12? Well, a couple things. One thing is the level's going to be too high but it's also going to be a little bit high for the dynamic mic, although it could be useful in some cases. The other problem is it's not loaded properly, and that's going to affect the performance of the mic. The condenser mics tend to sound a little brittle on the high end when they're loaded so lightly with 10,000 ohms instead of 1,500, and the transient response can change on some of them as well. There can also be some odd other artifacts that are introduced in, into the sound. Now, oftentimes it's not dramatic and you may find it useful, but just keep in mind it's not optimum. And even though it may sound good initially when you start listening to it, you know, long-term listening to that may show you that it's not exactly what you had in mind. So one of my original thoughts was to make the VT12 as universal as possible so people could use it on ribbon mics, on dynamic mics, and on condenser mics. But I quickly realized that doing all those things with one mic preamp involved more compromises than I was willing to make. And I decided to focus on optimizing the VT12 for ribbon mics and accommodating the other mics as best as possible. But really, the VT2 or VT1 is a better choice for a condenser mic. One thing that we added to the VT12, which also is on the VT1 and VT2, is a 20 dB input pad. This pad here, in the normal position down, gives you full gain. When you turn it up, it introduces a 20 dB pad into the audio pad. Now, that pad is designed so that when you switch it in, the load impedance that the microphone sees is closer to that 1500 ohm um, impedance that condenser mics and dynamic mics want to see. It also obviously reduces the gain by 20 dB. Now, that may sound like a, a solution to the problem. Well, the problem is that generally speaking on most um, miking situations, the output level of a condenser mic is still too high, even with that 20 dB pad. And that's why on the VT2 we have 54 dB of gain plus a 20 dB pad, making the maximum gain with a pad um, uh, 34 dB. And that works very well with the typical condenser microphone. But taking 70 dB and padding that down 20 to 50 dB is still a little bit too much gain for most condenser mics. Now, it could be useful in situations where the level of the mic is quite low, and uh, you know, distant mic or a quiet source um, low output mic, or if there's a pad on the condenser mic, if that is switched in, then that um, 20 dB position on the VT12 can be quite useful under those circumstances. Modern condenser microphones require powering. All condenser mics require power of some sort, but modern mics generally use what's called phantom power. That's a 48 volt um, power source that comes from the microphone preamplifier of the console or sometimes from a separate power supply, which provides the operating voltage for the condenser microphone to operate. And that system works very well. Now you'll notice that on older tube type or even modern tube type condenser microphones, they don't use phantom power. They have a separate power supply because a variety of voltages are necessary and the 48 volts wouldn't work for that. 
but the 48 volts provides a very convenient way to power the majority of modern condenser microphones. And most preamps and consoles have 48 volt power available just for that purpose. Now, there, you can run into a problem with phantom power with ribbon microphones. The way phantom power works, it applies a voltage in such a way that the microphone doesn't see it, but the special circuitry inside the mic is able to extract that voltage and route it to the amplifier circuitry. And a normal microphone, like a ribbon or a dynamic plugged into that, doesn't see the 48 volts, doesn't even know it's there. So in theory, you should be able to run your ribbon mics and your dynamic mics with phantom power on without a problem. And in fact, that's true, because in uh, early days of, of my career in recording, most consoles did not have provision for turning the phantom power off. It was on all the time. And we use ribbon mics and uh, dynamic mics all the time, and it never caused a problem. But there is a danger, and the danger occurs if there's a fault in the cable, anywhere in the cable between that 48-volt power source and the microphone. If the pin 2 or the pin 3 of an XLR connector is connected to pin 1 or the shield, uh, it can apply the full 48 volts across the microphone element. On a dynamic mic, if you were to have that, when you plugged it in, you might hear a little pop from the mic, but it probably wouldn't damage it. Probably wouldn't work very well under those conditions, but your microphone would probably be okay. But with ribbon mics under those circumstances, it can cause significant damage. In fact, it probably is going to require a trip back to the factory for a new ribbon. So for that reason, it's important to be careful that there's not phantom power on the microphone and when you plug in a ribbon mic. Another place where this can happen, even if your cables are in excellent condition, is in a patch panel. Now, I don't think patching microphones is a very good idea, particularly on the typical TRS um, patch panel. The reason being is when you push that patch cord in, the tip of that patch cord, and sometimes the um, ring of it, is going to momentarily contact the sleeve part, which is grounded, that's the shield part, of the jack when you plug it in. And that momentary connection is going to provide that 48 volts right to your microphones. And, you know, with condenser mics, that's not going to matter. It's going to upset them. They're going to make a racket until they settle down again, but it won't hurt them. But you do that to a ribbon microphone, it's the same problem as you have with a bad cable. And it probably means a trip back to the factory for a new ribbon in your ribbon mic. So in designing the VT12, my first thought was to leave phantom power out entirely. But then I thought, well, you know, this is based on the VT2. The, the phantom power supply is already built in. Um, we have it there available. Let's make it usable so that if you have a condenser mic you want to use with a VT12, you can power it. And you can also use some of the newer active ribbon mics, which require phantom power. So phantom power was part of the design. However, I wanted to make sure that it was very safe for the user so that they uh, made it very difficult for you to accidentally apply the 48 volt power to the ribbon microphone uh, accidentally. So what we did was we put a switch on the back panel of the VT12. And this switch will turn the phantom power on or off for both channels. It will disable it for both channels. So when it's down like it is now, you'll see that as long as the 48 volt phantom power switches off in the front panel, this indicator will be green. That green light means it's safe. There's nothing you can possibly do to apply 48 volts at this time. It's safe to plug in your ribbon mics. When we turn this switch on to the enable position, that light goes out. So that should be a warning to you that there is a potential for applying 48 volts power. Now, if we turn on the phantom power, you'll see this right uh, lamp turns red. It may be a little hard to see in the video. The video cameras don't seem to be very good at picking up the colors of these lights, but believe me, that's red. And that tells you that it's dangerous. You cannot plug in your ribbon microphone now. But what about if you have this off and the power disabled with a switch in the back down, but you accidentally had this switch up. 
You didn't realize it at the time. You had left this on. You went by and said, okay, I'm going to need phantom power for a condenser mic I'm going to put in the other channel. So I'll enable it and flip this up and you've applied 48 volt power. So the orange light tells you that there's danger, that as soon as you put this switch up now, you're going to apply power. So again, it's another safeguard so that you can't accidentally um, harm your ribbon mics. If you turn this on, rib ribbon, uh, the uh, phantom power is applied and the light turns red. So if we turn that off, we hit the disabled position, our lights are green and we're completely safe. So how does the VT12 sound on ribbon microphones? Well, throughout this tutorial, you've been listening to it. Up here in the shot, you may be able to see is a Coles 4038, which is picking up my voice. And that's going through the B channel here of the VT12. From there, it's being recorded on a Radar 24 system and uh, it will be processed with a little bit of VT7 compression and VT4 equalization before it's transferred to the video track. So this gives you an idea of what it sounds like. Now, my voice isn't all that loud and I'm at least a foot and a foot and a half away from this ribbon microphone. So the output level is quite low and I'm not really even addressing it straight on. So as you can see, we're getting a pretty good level even with this not all the way up. So we still have some reserve gain here. So that gives you a sense of how much gain the VT12 has available. Now I'm a big fan of ribbon microphones and I really uh, designed the VT12 for my own recording and found that it worked really well. It definitely has the same sound as my other products. There's a specific sound that, that I gravitate towards when I'm designing uh, new products and the VT12 fits right into that family. So if you're accustomed to the sound of the VT2 or VT1 mic preamps, the VT12 will sound very similar. In my personal mic collection, I actually have more ribbon microphones than I have condenser mics, and uh, I, I use them whenever I can. There's times when they're the best choice. You know, they have a lot of disadvantages, but they also have some advantages. The disadvantages are, first of all, they're fragile. They're fragile because of their susceptibility to damage with 48 volt power. They're mechanically fragile because the ribbon is very delicate. They can't take shock. They can't take rapid movement. They can't take even closing them up in a case, uh, if you're not, don't do it carefully, even just doing that or taking it out can damage the ribbon. So they take extra care. One of the other characteristics which you could look at as an advantage or a disadvantage is that they're bi-directional mics. They're equally sensitive from both sides with, with your classic ribbon microphone like this Coles 4038. Now, sometimes that can be an advantage because if you have two sound sources on either side, um, you can utilize that to record both of them simultaneously, which can be useful. But even in the case where you're not using the back side of the microphone like we are now, it can sometimes provide an interesting room sound that you can't get any other way. I always like that sound. In fact, I often run my condenser mics in the bi-directional position because I like what they do. I like that sound. I like that sound of the room. So that can be useful. Another characteristic that can be used as an advantage with the ribbon microphone is that it has extremely sharp nulls off the side of the microphone. All the way around the microphone, top, bottom, and sides, the uh, ribbon is almost completely insensitive to sound arriving from those directions. And oftentimes you can position the microphone in a way that it nulls out any bleed or other noises that you want to uh, minimize in your recording. So they're very good for that. And I find that usually that's more effective than a cardioid microphone, as long as you can position the mic in a way that it nulls out that interfering sound. And of course, there's a the sound of ribbon microphones. They just sound terrific. They have a transparency. They transport you much closer to the source of the sound, I think, than any other microphone. You hear through the microphone right to the source much better than you do uh, with dynamic microphones for sure, and oftentimes better than condenser microphones. But you have to realize they have limitations. Low output, um, very fragile, cannot be used outside at any time. Um, they can't even be used in, if they're close to a, an air outlet of your um, HVAC system. 
but you can use ribbon mics to get an excellent sound. And the VT12 is the perfect microphone preamplifier for providing that sound.